It's uh, time uh, for the uh, CareCast, brought to you by the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit at Mayo Clinic. I'm Victor Montori, your host for this CareCast, and today we are in for a treat. Um, Arlene uh, Bierman, Dr. Arlene Bierman, is uh, with us. Uh, she leads the uh, CEPI, which is the Center for um, uh, pra Evidence and Practice Improvement at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality of the United States Government. Arlene is a uh, journal internist, a geriatrician, a health services researcher. Uh, today, we're going to be exploring a range of, uh, of, of topics uh, in, in the fashion that we have uh, followed here at the CareCast, but uh, we, are, we are very lucky to have you, Arlene. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, hi, Victor. Thank you. So um, the first question that we always um, ask in these things is, um, how, how, how does one become Arlene Bierman? What, what's, what's the journey like? Is it something you chose to uh, do when you, were, uh, when you were little and you followed a, a straight path? Or has it been a convoluted uh, path, uh, a mixture of uh, choice and chance? Yeah, well, I can say I've taken the scenic route, which has been nice. Um, so I was born in Brooklyn, New York. My family was living in the projects at the time I was born. Um, I grew up working class in Queens, and I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. But I was very lucky having been born in New York City where we had access to, you know, good public schools at the time. Um, we had uh, museums and the Philharmonic in the park and great libraries, uh, Shakespeare in the park. So I had lots of advantages, e even though our means were, were pretty modest. Um, so anyway, that's, that's where I came from. And, and how do you end up where you are now? I mean, uh, did, you, um, so, did you choose to uh, be in government? Uh, how, how, is that, how did that happen? Uh, so I've, I've done many things across the course of my career. Um, when I graduated um, from medical school, I actually went back to my old neighborhood in Queens where I practiced, I practiced for over a decade in the public hospitals of New York City. Um, I ran the Department of Ambulatory Care there and a primary care internal medicine residency program. I've also, you know, I'm working in government now. I, I did a stint in government before and I've also been an academic. So I've I've taken a couple of different paths in my career. And, and what has what has what has motivated those those paths? Is it is it just you know opportunities that you chose to take? Uh, how how does how did you navigate all those paths? I think you know one thing you know went into another. Um, I always wanted you know I I clearly you know returned back to New York City to take care of people who were you know underinsured, poor, um, uninsured, because that was my that's what motivated me to go to med school, um, and then I quickly learned that you know there's all kinds of challenges within the health system, so there was a lot I wanted to contribute to fixing them and making care higher quality and more equitable and. Just, I think, you know, just being open, willing to take chances and, you know, seeing what comes along is how I got here. You know, many people um, say that they went to medical school to help people, but then a lot of people must have forgotten that, right? I mean, uh, how, how, you didn't. Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's powerful, you know, um, socializing forces in medical training. And I think it is challenging to resist them. But I, for me, it was always key to say, stay, you know, um, close to who I was um, and, you know, maintain certain values and knowing, you know, knowing the reason I was going into medicine, which was really, it was to help people, of course, but also to help communities and, and help increase, um, you know, access to care for people who were challenged. Was, was, the, uh, was the bedside not enough to do that? Um, it, I think it's important. 
it's important and I love practicing and um, it was really pretty cool. I, I worked working in Queens in my old neighborhood. Um, you know, I would run into my patients in the, uh, I lived in the neighborhood and I would run into them in the uh, fruit stand. I remember a diabetic saying, look, I'm buying with his wife, look, we're buying vegetables and fruits. And I said, oh, that's great, you know? So yes, there's, I think there's a lot of rewards in the practice of medicine of being able to hear, help people one-on-one, -on -one, but also very enriching, learning people's stories and learning a lot about life. Um, one of the things we did, it was very interesting. Um, in We were asked to do quality improvement, which I knew nothing about. And you know, as a team, we decided, okay, what is the biggest problem? And we were all tired of seeing women come into the clinic with late stage breast cancer. This is this is in Queens. This is in Queens. Half of our patients were uninsured. Um, you know, then the rest were a mix of uh, Medicaid and Medicare. And and we actually did find out there were a sizable number of people who had private insurance, and they just thought we were good doctors, so they didn't tell anybody. So. <laughs> They came to see us anyway, but we didn't collect because they didn't tell us they were insured. So we think we fixed that. Um, but with it, and and um, so, but our our patients were from all over the world. It was the most um, ethnically diverse zip code actually in all of the U.S. from 110 countries, and uh, lots of people also who were not exposed to preventive medicine before. And we all worked together. We worked, you know, with the clinicians and nurses. We had standing orders of why this was important. We had videos in multiple languages and handouts in the um, waiting room. And within a year, um, we had rates of mammography screening of 80% higher than the best HMOs uh, in this very challenged community. And I think at that time, I realized, well, maybe we didn't do it in a research way. Um, we just kind of thought about what, what would it take to fix this and sort of at that point I decided I wanted to go back and get research skills and learn how to do this in a way that was more generalizable. And, and where did you do that? Um, at Dartmouth. So oh, I, I got okay. a, that's, that's an okay place, right? That's, yeah, it was all right. <laughs> I, got, so <laughs> I, I got a master's um, in health services research and I, I learned how to work with big databases. And, and uh, how was that experience of going from uh, I mean, many, many researchers, uh, sometimes to a fault, uh, seem disconnected from the realities on the ground, uh, particularly health services research that, that see the world through databases and through the data, uh, but, but having had the experience of being on the ground with patients and with clinicians, how, how did the experience of going from the ground and trying to improve things on the ground to the you know, the, the, the distance uh, of, of the classroom and of the database, how, how did that fit you? So, you know, that's an interesting question, Victor. It was, it was, it was a marvelous opportunity. I learned so much um, and I, I did, I, I found that I had a patient, uh, you know, uh, passion for working with big, you know, databases, secondary databases, which I didn't know before. But I should say, and I went in there with a very clear um, goal of, of why I wanted to learn the research skills. And it really was, how do I do research that could really um, advance health equity and improve access to care and quality of care for people who, um, you know, I think the COVID epidemic has really brought home how, how disparate our health system is. Um, you know, we have the best care in the world and then we have the worst care in the world in the same country. Um, I should say that, you know, when I was studying at Dartmouth at that time, I was interested in health equity, which has become very trendy, a lot of attention to it. Nobody was interested in it at that point. Um, and how, how come? I mean, how, how could they have been so, so uh, I think, interested? Oh, I, think it's, I think it's the work of a lot of people, a lot of researchers who in aggregate have, have educated people and have documented the magnitude and the relevance of the problem. And it was interesting. I was thinking about becoming a researcher and kind of a little discouraged that nobody was excited about the questions that I wanted to research. And um, I actually listened to an interview with Martin Scorsese and, and, and Hollywood. And he said, um, well, you know, I'm from a different place and my, you know, my movies are about that place. So I just said, okay, I'm from a different place and my research is about that place. And, and, you know, I've continued to um, really having spent over a decade, you know, in the trenches, 
I think still informs my research. You know, I am so glad that I've had that experience. And, uh, and I presume you discovered that there is plenty of room for women in academia. Oh, <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> oh, come on, we have to go there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it is a major challenge, isn't it? And, and uh, I think uh, um, it's very hard uh, to, for, for women to have uh, successful careers uh, as judged by, by academia successful careers in academia, right? I mean, was that evident at the time you went through it? Oh, oh yes. You know, I think there's lots of bias, you know, um, but I just really kept my focus on what I was doing and why I was doing it. And, you know, knew, you know, I knew there was bias in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you, you were experiencing it from the clinic. Yeah. Uh, how how did you so once you once you were armed with those uh, with that research armamentarium so to speak uh, did you go back to Queens? No, so this is funny. I did. I you know my plan initially um, was to you know get the research training and go back to Queens and keep doing what I was doing, um, and then I got it kind of got derailed along the way. Um, I think well there were two things that happened. Um, one was New York changed a lot. You know, I was doing in, in Queens, we were doing community oriented primary care, things that people are talking about now. So I think it's, you know, going back to the future. Yeah, um, the pendulum, my, yeah. My, my first grant was from the United Hospital Fund, which really developed a strong um, partnership between the hospital and community-based organizations in our community. We were working on setting up um, family health clinics as satellites. I actually established the first uh, family health clinic in a, in a New York City public hospital. So we were doing all kinds of cool stuff, but um, you know, the governance in the city had changed um, where that wasn't as well supported. And actually leaving New York, and I had two young boys at the time, I realized that there were better places in the world to raise kids. So I ended up not going back. Yeah. And where did you go? I ended up going to AHRQ. So I spent a stint at ARC and I never in, ever thought I would go to government. So I think it's like kind of just being passionate and being curious and being willing to take risks. I actually had been um, offered a job of, uh, as chair of preventive medicine in a, in a major medical school. And a good friend of mine said, and I had turned down ARC, and a good friend of mine said to me, are you crazy? You think you're gonna run a department, teach, see patients and build a research career? And at that time I was offered an intramural research position at ARC, they had those in those days. They said, take that, you know, to get paid full time to do research, you know? And actually it turned out to be one of the best jobs in my life and I loved it. I worked, um, I actually had two hats when I was at ARC the first round. I was a intramural researcher, you know, focused on both health equity issues and disparities, um, as well as on, um, you know, uh, patient reported outcomes, functional health outcomes in, in older people with chronic disease. So it's kind of split. But I was uh, also a senior advisor um, on aging to John Eisenberg. And I worked very closely with him and he just taught me so much and just made me think I could do a whole lot more than I ever imagined, you know, that I had not think, thought about doing. It, it's interesting every time I've met anybody that met John Eisenberg, which I have not, I didn't get a chance to meet. Uh, everybody that talks about him um, speaks highly of, of him as somebody that was able to build uh, AHCPR and ARC um, uh, and, and to do so with enormous, uh, mystic and uh, great capacity for mentorship. Uh, is, is that an accurate depiction? Oh, absolutely. I wrote a paper with him on, I called it the paper from hell, um, on, co on uh, collecting racial and ethnic data um, that was eventually, um, you know, published in Health Affairs. And he would give me, you know, drafts back, correcting my grammar and my commas. And I felt so embarrassed, but he, he taught me how to write. And he taught me how to write about sensitive issues because at that time, you know, uh, collecting racial and ethnic data wasn't, ex you know, acceptable like it is now or assumed. And to, he taught me how to write about issues that might be sensitive in, a, in an objective way that could, you know, educate people why it was important. You know, listening to you, one gets the impression of 
local and regional government and then federal government having roles in, in giving people opportunity to get exposure to culture, uh, to services, to care, to education, uh, and, and government as a, as a force for innovation and advancement. Uh, we don't have that picture of government uh, every day, but you seem to have experienced it firsthand. No, and you know, it's like, you know, once, you know, now I'm here, nobody would know like what, where I came from or my background. And I think about that, like I grew up in a really golden age of New York City. And, you know, you know, the access we had, you know, to culture, but also, you know, like free tuition in the um, universities, as well as, you know, one of my first jobs in healthcare, I was uh, working the midnight shift in a fast food um, hamburger restaurant underneath the, uh, the Triborough Bridge and I got an urban core job. And with that job, I was able to work. I worked as a phlebotomist, a lab tech, a respiratory therapy aide. And that actually, you know, kind of reaffirmed my motivation to go on and study medicine, so. Yeah, and then, and then uh, in your first stint at ARC, you know, bringing attention to important issues, innovating science about, you know, how to write about these issues of, for instance, uh, race. You know, it's, uh, it's you know, government uh, employees at the forefront of science. Um, you know, sometimes we forget about that. Yeah, no, I mean, I never in a million years like thought I would end up in government, but I don't know if you read The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis. Uh, it's on my list. Well, anyway, you know, I kind of was annoyed at the book, like he goes into, you know, um, agriculture and, you know, some of the other science energy, and he finds all these amazing scientists doing all this amazing work. And it's like, well, you should know that's what government can do for people. And there are, and I mean, when I look at, one of the things I love working about at ARC is just the smart people who are there. And people come to ARC and, and come to government because they're, passionate, committed, and they and they want to make changes and they want to contribute to change. Uh, bright brains with a heart in the right place. I, I uh, for full disclosure, um, Arlene was my boss at, uh, at ARC for, uh, I had the opportunity and the pleasure and the honor to uh, be a, a senior advisor uh, for ARC for a few years. And, uh, and that was my experience, which is, a, uh, the opportunity to interact with bright people with that uh, wanted to make a difference and that they had chosen a government opportunity to actually make that difference. It was extremely inspiring. And, uh, and, I, and they were, of course, working under your leadership, Arlene. So that was uh, very inspiring to see. If, if, you, were to, if you were to think about, um, and, and we're not yet uh, finished with your trajectory because that was your first time at ARC, but uh, if you were to think about what is the primary value that animates uh, your choices in, in, in your career, what, what would that primary value be? I think I've alluded it to it, it's equity. I mean, you know, I think the, the consequences of in income and racial and ethnic inequity in our country is really in front of, we can't ignore it anymore. But that, you know, and the, and the, and the, and the you know, the hardships in people's lives that are unnecessary, as well as the loss to society of all these people who could make amazing contributions, you know? Um, so, so I think, you know, just, and, and feeling part of a community, um, you know, as a researcher, I really felt strongly that I was part of a community who were publishing, who were writing about equity issues, writing about disparities, writing about better ways to deliver care, and even to change things. It's it's being part of a community who could put all this evidence together that eventually adds up and makes changes. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a beautiful community. The um, uh, but it's it's been uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I I, I have a I have a, a bit of a weird perception of the of the health services research community. I think on the one hand, um, you know, it's described uh, very well uh, if we were to think of people like you. But there's also a, another set of people who perhaps are newer to the field who are enamored with the data. You know, um, some of them, in fact, uh, carry titles like data scientists and so forth, and they're they're dealing with massive, massively large data sets, uh, and they are able to do you know incredible feats of alchemy with them, with algorithms and and uh, and and computations that are, you know, hard to follow sometimes. Um, 
and, and it just, you know, I, I wonder if, if my, uh, John's view of that is uh, similar to perhaps the, the old expression of uh, armchair epidemiologists, right? The, mm -hmm. there, there's a bit of a disconnect between the reality that is perceived through the cloud of data and the reality that you've seen, for instance, in the streets of Queens. Do, do you have a similar sense of that or, or do you are more no, are you optimistic? <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I think that, first of all, I actually once wrote a book chapter on how to analyze secondary data. So I am a total data nerd and I totally um, appreciate um, the value of data. I'm working on a project at ARC on developing algorithms to uh, identify frailty and, you know, so, I, you know, in um, claims and EHR data in partnership with ASPE. So this is something, you know, I enjoy, you know, and I, and I see the power and the value. I think we do need data. But when I wrote that chapter, the first thing I said is you have to start with the question and not with the data. Mm. Um, and you really have to understand what the data is representing. So, you know, I think we can just, there are people doing that. And I think we just need to encourage that. That, And I think, you know, taking the um, data in isolation without understanding what's underpinning it can sometimes lead to mis misleading conclusions. Yeah, and, and with the spirit of your primary value, there's also this uh, increasing recognition that, that the data that is then used to answer questions, the data itself was produced um, by uh, individuals and systems that uh, may have uh, significant biases uh, in, in discriminatory uh, practices that then manifest in the data and then carry on into the research, right? Yeah, so I don't know if you've loved, another book I highly recommend is a book called um, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. I don't know if you've read that one, but it really talks about all the pitfalls of using data without critically understanding what, you know, the biases in it and, and, and what it's doing. Yeah, and this, this year's Academy Health uh, keynote uh, spoke about the other challenges, which are not mathematical or not, uh, you know, algorithmic, but have to do with the, uh, uh, you know, further discrimination of folks on the basis of, um, of who contributes and how they contribute to the data and, and who decides what data then gets to be included in analysis. So there is a threat to equity now uh, through, through data, which- Yeah, is, uh, and I'll tell you a story about that. I think more and more we need mixed methods to really validate what the data is telling us. And we didn't talk about my stint up at the University of Ontario and in Toronto. For it. I was a PI for a large study um, that did a health equity report for the um, uh, province of Ontario. And we used a partnership community engaged approach in the context of this big data project. And we got to people together to, you know, get input. You know, we both had experts like technical expert panels, but we got the community to tell us what we should be measuring and help us select our indicators. And when they looked at our access indicators, they're not surprising, everybody knows them, you know, avoidable hospitalizations, um, you know, barriers, difficult to getting appointments, like all the standard access measures. And they looked at us and they said, yes, you should report these. And they told us which ones they thought were more important. But they said, but you're missing our experience. Um, it doesn't capture the challenges we have getting care. So in response to the community, we actually did a qualitative study of, uh, we've, of um, barriers to care of women from different um, disadvantaged groups in Ontario, immigrants, racial ethnic minorities, First Nation, disabled women, LGBTQ women. There was a huge literature out there. I learned, I work with a PhD student and, uh, and her um, supervisor who were qualitative researchers learned a lot about qualitative research. And we ended up with two papers, um, one on all the barriers people you know, experience. And then we found one on agency that we don't think of that everything that people do to deal with the system and how they overcome it. And some of those strategies are good and others are not so good. Um, but then when we wrote up our, our, our indicators, when we ran all our data, it provided context to interpret what we were seeing. So I think that's really, uh, really important. And also, you know, sort of checking back, you know, that's a, a qualitative thing, but even quantitative things. I was invited to present our results up in Muskoka, Ontario, which is where it's a cottage country um, and, you know, to the local health integration network. 
And they did terrible on a lot of the measures. You know, they had more readmissions, more avoidable admissions. And I said, could this be right? You know, I, th I thought of it as like, you know, affluent cottage country. And before publishing, we, I went up there, I showed them the results. I said, does this resonate with you? They said, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of people here who are disadvantaged. We don't have, you know, good coordinated care and we have holes in our health system. But I, so I do think it's important, even if you're working with big data to go back and, you know, validate it with the community. Yeah, that, that's, that seems to be a, a lesson that uh, needs to be learned and relearned and relearned and relearned. Um, in our unit, um, Arlene, we have uh, three values, uh, patient-centeredness, integrity, and generosity. Any of these three strike you as closest, closest to your heart? That's so hard. It's like choosing between your children, but I think they're all really, really important. Um, but I would pick patient-centeredness. Why would we, why would you do that? Uh, because I think if we have to have an effective healthcare system, we need one that is centered on patients, who they are as people, their lives, what their needs are, and then I think you can't do patient-centeredness without um, generosity and integrity. So maybe I'm cheating a little. Yeah, yeah, I think you are, but I think you're right as well. It turns out that everyone we've asked that question ends up on some variation of the fact that it doesn't matter which one you choose, you need the other two anyway. <laughs> Otherwise, you're dangerous. Um, tell, us about, tell us about going to Canada. How, how did that come about? And, and what, was, what was different about that experience? Oh, it was a wonderful experience. So uh, um, I should say my mother is from Montreal. So I had a, a Canadian connection. I, you know, I used to spend summers in Montreal with my uncle and my grandmother. So it wasn't, you know, a strange place. I think Toronto is a great city. Um, and it, to me, it was like a livable New York where I could live midtown, raise two kids and afford to live there. So, you know, it had a lot of draws. Um, yeah, I ended up going to the University of Toronto and I actually had an endowed research chair. So I did a stint as an academic um, and I, as a you know tenured full professor with an endowed chair, I came back to ARC. So, you know, the choices I make are not the choices I think many other people would make. Yeah, and but I think those, those are the choices animated by what you say is knowing what matters to you mm -hmm. and where, where you might make the biggest difference. Um, coming back to coming back to government from a tenured professorship position is almost like you're pathologically looking for discomfort. Yeah, and people thought I was crazy, but I love you know I I you know like I say well you've been you know what it's like where we are I get to work with a lot of smart people um, and I get to really um, I think make a difference in you know in the research that's done um, across the country in in improving care. Absolutely. If you were to think back, I mean, it sounds like you've had phenomenal collaborations with, um, with your colleagues in Queens, in the clinic, and with the communities there, um, uh, perhaps with the academics at Dartmouth, uh, perhaps with Eisenberg and other colleagues at your first stint at ARC, your colleagues in Canada, you describe a big collaboration there, now your colleagues at ARC. If you were to think back, what, what has been your favorite collaboration, your best collaboration? I'm going to cheat again and give you two. <laughs> so, um, I think at, um, in, in Ontario, I was, a, you know, I mentioned before, I was a principal investigator of the power study that presented a health equity, developed a um, health equity report for the province of Ontario. And I actually had 60 co-investigators who had expertise in the different, you know, um, reports that we did. But we also partnered with like, um, you know, the system, the Ministry of Health, the local health integrated networks, you know, patient advocates, community organizations, public health. So, and it was exciting bringing all these people together to have conversations. So it wasn't the data so much or the findings. It's like, what is this telling us? And what does this mean for the health system? And, you know, when we started the project, I, I insisted on like publishing the data at the regional level. And people were very nervous about it. They had just um, created the local health inter integration networks. And, you know, we don't know if you should do that. People are going to get upset. And the way we framed it is, no, that you just created them. They need to know their baseline. They need to know where they are so they can do better. 
And we actually worked with the LINs. We showed them their data before we published it. We gave them our SAS code so they could run and track the indicators they wanted. And it, and it worked out well, you know? So I think you have to kind of be creative and how do you do these things in a way that's positive? So that was a great collaboration really broadly. I could say now at ARC, I'm just really excited about my e-care planning project. So uh, we have funding from ASPE, which is the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, which gets a portion of the People Trust Fund. And, and the purpose of this funding is to develop infrastructure to better do patient-centered outcomes research. And Victor, you know, my passion for improving care with people for multiple chronic conditions, but one of the barriers is you don't know what everybody else is doing and, and you lose a lot of what's happening to them if they go to different systems, different practices. So the real need for like an interoperable care plan that shares data across providers that's accessible to patients. And it's been a great collaboration. We're partnered with um, NIDDK, we're developing it together. Um, it's interesting, NIDDK started working on a um, care plan for people with chronic kidney disease and I was working on one for multiple chronic conditions and they quickly realized that, hey, these people with kidney disease have multiple other things. So they need, and, and you know, and they have a lot of the, more of the technical know-how than I did. So it's a great, it's a great partnership. So we're doing that together, but we also have multiple federal partners involved. Um, CMS, VA, Indian Health Service, ACL, I won't go on and on. So the federal team, you know, in terms of, collaborating across the federal government, understanding how this could inform federal programs. But beyond that, we have um, technical expert panels who are helping us choose the data elements. Um, but we've also partnered, um, HL7 has adopted us. So that hopefully that these will be the standards to allow um, information to exchange um, interoperably. And what we were worried about is there's a lot of movements on care plans and it'll end up like EHR, where it's the Wild West and they don't talk to each other and they're all a little different. So we thought if we could get at the head of the game and develop the technical standards, people could use these and build on them and maybe we could have interoperable care plans one day. So that's, you know, that's a great collaboration. Yeah, I mean, so, so people, people listening to this or, or watching this are gonna go, wait a minute, these are, these are federal agencies working together on this. What what world is this that we're talking about? That is phenomenal. So so Arlene, what, what does it take personally to 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 foster these collaborations? I suspect that's not the default. That it takes uh, it takes substantial commitment to the project and and uh, effort. And I mean, what what, what does it take? I think it's willingness um, to listen and to share. And other people are sharing with us too. So for example, um, you know, CMS had wor been worked on developing a care plan for um, electronic, you know, long-term care services and supports. So they're willing to give us what they've done so we could in incorporate it in ours. So I think making it a win-win, understanding what people's problems are, understanding how you could develop this in a way, you know, I think we're going to have a better product because we're going to know what our partners need in the in the care plan to make it work. Yeah, so you have uh, a diversity of scientists, a diversity of collaborators, communities. Are users involved as well? Excuse me. Are, are user users involved as well? Yes, yes, they are. So we have, um, you know, a contract. Um, we have well, users are involved in a couple of ways. We've included patients on our. Um, you know, technical expert panels to talk about the measures and what they want to share about themselves. But we also have um, uh, a contract with RTI and OHSU where we're doing focus groups and user testing. And also the uh, developers are doing use. So yes, we're using user-centered design um, to be able to develop this uh, plan. Fantastic. Um, uh, we, we are getting questions now from some of the folks that are here, and um, I, I will uh, select a few of those for us to consider as we go forward. But one, one of the things that uh, is coming uh, uh, strongly here in our conversation is that uh, government is a potentially great place for a young scientist to develop. And, and, and so the person asking the question uh, says, would you encourage young scientists today to pursue careers in governments? Why yes or why not? 
So absolutely. And, you know, um, maybe I planted that question because I'm recruiting. So if anybody wants to come work with us at ARC, we have a number of positions. So just reach out to me. But also, you know, I, I, what I want people to know is that whatever, you, at different phases of your life, you find a place where you can do the best with what you have and what your interests are. So that's what I tell people. It doesn't preclude going back into academia. You know, I was in practice. You know, I, I, you know, I went to government. I went to academia. I'm back in government. So I think, you know, and it, and it enriches your experience. And I can tell people from, you know, working at ARC the first time, I learned a lot on being on the funding side. So I was really great grant writer when I went back to academia because I learned how grants were evaluated, why things were funded or not. And so there's a lot of skills you could pick up also that you might not appreciate um, before coming. It's interesting, when I was uh, considering a position um, in, in government, um, I was told by my advisors that once, once you go to government, you never come back to academia. So your clarification, I think, and your demonstration in your own life mm -hmm. I, uh, stands as in contradiction to that, uh, that ill advice I got. Um, and then somebody asked, asked the question, are there ways of contrib to contribute and engage in government work without moving to Washington? Ah, uh, well, yeah, yes and no. So that's hard. I mean, I, I wish government was a little bit more flexible in terms of, you know, distance working, but we have different ways people come work with us. Um, we have fellows who come and spend some time and rotate with us. We have people sometimes are able to come on an IPA which is, you know, part of their time spent with us. Um, so I think there's, there's, and then there's being participating, you know, we're very, um, ARC is very committed to engaging with stakeholders and we have expert panels and other ways of kind of contributing your ideas. So there's ways to kind of get engaged with us without necessarily becoming a Fed, so. And some, some of the most brilliant uh, uh, health services researchers also work for the local and state governments, right? Mm -hmm. So that might be another opportunity is to engage with the local and state government, uh, um, me local Medicaid agency. Uh, you know, these are all, all there's other opportunities to work in government that is not necessarily federal government, but it's, uh, it's state government. I guess that's another option. And it's, you know, and I, I think the advice I would also give is, you know, find out like what question are you asking and why, you know? Um, and if you get an answer, it's like the big so what question. And I think, you know, a lot of my research questions have been informed. I've had like a nascent idea, but really having it refined by, you know, um, consulting with the people who you hope to use your research um, so that it is, answering a question in a way that, that helps them. Arlene, this series um, of CareCast um, is in the context of our uh, program of work of care that fits. You know, how do we help um, patients and clinicians form plans of care that make emotional, intellectual, and practical sense to them and fit in their lives? And then how do we help patients work at home or in the or work or wherever they're they're developing themselves to to make sure that that plan of care follows them particularly for patients with chronic conditions follows them through life in ways that are perhaps minimally disruptive um we yesterday or the last couple of days are hosted a, a, a multi-disciplinary international meeting on multiple chronic conditions and i know you were active participant and leader in that meeting what does it mean to you uh, today to make care fit? I think the care we have doesn't fit, right? And it particularly, it doesn't fit for everybody. It doesn't fit for, um, especially people who have multiple chronic conditions, which is the norm. Um, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, Jane Peterson who was working with us on helping us organize this meeting said she told her husband, who's, you know, uh, you know, an intensivist and pulmonologist, what she was working on. And he goes, but does, isn't that what everybody has? And I said, yes, and that's the whole point, um, you know, that people get, um, see different providers, different settings, get fragmented care, and we treat one disease at a time um, and not the person with the disease. And uh, to me is care that fits is taking care of people 
um, not their diseases, but their people and who happen to have different diseases in the context of their lives and recognizing their values, preferences, and goals in shaping a care plan. Oftentimes that is unavailable to clinicians either because of clinicians' lack of uh, curiosity or skill to pick up the information that one gets from asking those questions and integrating them into, into care. Um, but it sounds from your experience in both in New York and Toronto that you had tremendous exposure for, uh, for, uh, to people from all over the world. Um, how, how has that shaped uh, your perspective about making care fit? Well, I do think that we have to change, you know, we have to totally change care. And I think it's a culture change in medicine. Um, I think we have to change how we organize and deliver and pay for care. So I don't think it's easy. But I can tell you when, you know, most of my work was clinical and I was sitting in the clinic in Queens, everybody who came into my office in an afternoon literally was from not only a different country, a different region of the world. And I would just sit back and ask, I said like, um, you know, what did you do back home was my standard question. And I would get these amazing stories and I was able to relate to my, you know, patients in a way of having a sense of, you know, heard incredible stories of, you know, people who had to leave, you know, were engineers and had to leave for political, you know, reasons and were now driving a cab in New York. and. You know, but I didn't see them as a cab, cab driver and knowing who they were and the disappointments and traumas, you know, people experience torture, like just having a sense, who is this person in front of you? And what are the things that have impacted their lives and their health, I think, makes you a better doctor? Yeah, the, uh, we talk about uh, taking into account their biology and their biography. And in your case, it was mm -hmm. really biographical data that you were after when you were asking that question. Any of those stories stick to, stick to your mind to this day? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I know there's, there's lots of them. It's, it's hard to uh, pick one. I, I think, you know, the, the one I mentioned who was a, a cab driver who was an engineer and got, was asked to do some things that he thought he was working for, you know, a government, you know, uh, input and was kind of being encouraged to get involved in some corruption and and he will, he would have no part of it. And he left the, and because he refused, he was being, you know, threatened and he left the country and he was making a new life in the U S. Yeah, it is. Uh, there is something, um, um, I, I know I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, there's something somewhat romantic about a, um, some of the things that you're describing, particularly back in your time in Queens in relation to, um, having time to sit back and listen to stories, the opportunity to create a clinic, you know, that is open to everyone, uh, regardless of ability to pay, that is able to do so with high degrees of quality and commitment to care. Why does it feel, maybe it's me, but what, maybe not, why does it feel that that is a world that is no longer with us? You no, know, we've lost a lot, but it wasn't so, I think there were a lot of things that needed to change back then. You know, we still had the same pressure for volume. Um, you know, visits were often too short, um, especially for complex patients. But I think, you know, people don't realize if you know your patients well, it's much more efficient and you could do better care. And even if I got to know them over a series of visits, over, and that's why continuity, I think, is so important. Um, and I do think we have to move, to think about how do we redesign re care. And I can tell you what, as you know, I, you know, I directed a department of ambulatory care at the hospital, and we did half a million, it was a big department, we did about half a million visits a year. And then we started getting, I started getting volume visits from like, prenatal clinics, um, you know, well baby checks. And I said, I cannot see, you know, my 90 year old only Italian speaking woman with five diseases in a wheelchair with an amputation in five minutes. I can't ask my doctors to do that. Um, and, but I found as we were pressured to see pe more people faster, quality declined. Because rather than understanding what the issue is, what's going on, uh, working with people on you know, a, a plan of care that they could live with that would actually improve their health, 
you're more pressured to make a referral, order a test so that you haven't missed something. So I think that there's huge value in redesigning care so that it is human. And, 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 and what do we think? Like, I remember I would do a clearance, um, you know, a surgical clearance for, you know, so I'm a geriatrician as well, you know, a 90 year old who needed cataract surgery, who had all these issues, right? And I would not, you know, I'd get an office visit for doing this clearance. And then the, you know, ophthalmologist got, you know, thousands of dollars for taking out the cataract. And then afterwards, any issues she had, I was the one managing it, right? So I, you know, we really do have to think about how we allocate resources within healthcare and why can't we allocate resources to do better primary care? I think it's worth the investment. Yeah, there is a, um, I, you know, there is a connection between continuity of care, unhurried conversations, care itself, and then care quality and improvement of outcomes. And um, Mark Linzer, who I know you know, um, yeah. uh, you know, demonstrated in, in Hennepin County how the slowing down the clinic had an effect of maybe creating a bit of a waiting list that uh, you know went up first but then as patients got their issues addressed in the, the first time you know correctly they didn't go back to the back of the queue and continue to put pressure on the system they went on to to um, to demand less health care so uh, there, there is that right yeah i'll give you two great examples of that i remember one of my patients who was you know in her late 50s, she was overweight. She had, you know, type 2 diabetes and hypertension. She was depressed, you know, very common. And taking the time to ask her, you know, you know, explaining that, you know, maybe she could get off some of her, you know, medicines if she lost a little weight and was more active, which we, you know, sometimes see as futility. But working with her, what do you like to do? And it turned out she liked to dance. And she took up ballroom dancing. She met people, so she was socially engaged. She lost a lot of weight, and she eventually came off all her meds. And to me, that's a success story of medicine. But that takes time and relationships. Um, another patient of mine was um, a retired truck driver. Again, he had had multiple heart attacks. He had end-stage COPD. He probably smoked in his truck. Um, and he was one of these people who was re readmitted every week or every month with, you know, decompensated heart failure or, um, you, know, uh, you know, COPD exacerbation. And, you know, I, it took a while, but understanding who he was, who his life, it, you know, so getting him on a good regimen, one that he could manage, you know, controlling his disease. But the biggest problem for him was he rented a room on the top floor of an old house that was very dusty and moldy. And that was his, you know, no matter what he did, unless that changed, he was not gonna be stabilized. And actually working with the social worker in the clinic, we had social workers, we had liaison psychiatrists, so none of this is new. The social worker was able to get him into, into subsidized housing and he spent about a year and a half without get, having an admission. So, you know, that's, so I think there's values to the system and getting it right and allowing people to have the time to understand why why are people in the state they are and what can you do to reverse it? Yeah, I, as you know, I'm very committed to this notion of re, um, sh you know, shifting the aims of uh, healthcare organizations that um, that seem very committed to their operational efficiencies, uh, the pursuit of value and uh, value to whom. Uh, mm -hmm. um, at the end, and fortunately, it's it, it is a bit of a zero sum game. And when the resources are tight, what you've described in terms of the churning of the patients because of the shortened amount of time with them, it's a it's a universal phenomenon, and uh, it occurs in in uh, systems that innate, that allow for-profit healthcare, but it also, it also occurs in systems that are publicly funded and uh, where simply by decisions of austerity measures, the system is severely underfunded. And so the, the final pathology of care, if I may, is this churning of patients, which is cruel for patients because they're looking for care and they're not getting much of a choice, but there's also pretty cruel uh, for clinicians because you don't, you don't uh, get to care for them within that narrow, in that such a narrow window. Yeah, no, and I think 
you know, I was fortunate to have like the window of being able to practice um, when the pressures weren't as great. There certainly were pressures, but not as great as they are now and see that transition and feeling like it was actually harder and harder for me to practice in a way that I thought was effective and valuable. And maybe who knows if the system had, hadn't changed and, and was different, I'd still be back in Queens, you know, happily, uh, you know, practicing medicine, so. Yeah, um, we have a couple more questions that relate to career, and um, and one of them is uh, has to do with as you as you pursue a research that is participatory, um, how do you um, how do you find uh, what what is your so there's a lot of Picori, for instance, has been being very active at the moment uh, with uh, trying to engage stakeholders and patients in research. People struggle with this, you know, who are these people that get to participate as stakeholders? Who are these people that have the time and disposition to actually take part in research as uh, patient partners? Um, do we have equity issues in, 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 the, in that patient? What are, you, what, what are your thoughts about the state of patient engagement or involvement in research? Well, first of all, I just want to say, you know, absolutely how critical that is. Um, and in order to, you know, really inform your questions, inform what you're asking. I think we do need, you know, engagement of people or patients um, in, in that research. That being said, yes, it has to be real. You have to think about who it is, where they're coming from, why they're involved. And I think, you know, that's the, um, I think that's the advantage of being engaged in your community, because then you could really, you know, identify people who are, who are users, who, who, who you're serving, who can actually, you know, so I do think people need to be cautious of, you know, not just, it's not like a checkbox in an EHR, you happen to have a patient, but what is the relationship? What are they representing and what can they bring to the project? And diversity, absolutely, to make sure that, you know, different patient voices are captured. Do you, do you see a time where uh, research funding agencies will fund patient-led research? Uh, research that uh, where the PI is a patient, not an academic? I don't know. I really don't know. That's a, that's a great thought. I do think it's a time for us to really think, you know, not only what, what research questions, you know, I always thought like research is, what matters in research is not only what questions get asked, but who gets to ask them. So, you know, whether that's a partnership with patients, whether it's patient led, but I do think we need to start rethinking in a lot of ways, like how do we do research? How do we keep it rigorous? And you know, make sure that we're doing good science, but really open it up um, to a lot more different perspectives. Yeah, it's a, it's you know, and and who gets to judge whether the research is worth funding, right? Mm -hmm. We have the same problem with uh, review committees, where uh, again, Picori has been able to expand the review committees to include patient representative and other stakeholders, but has had to deal with issues of training them and so forth, and and uh, and again, issues of of um, representativeness uh, versus uh, advocacy. So many of the folks initially that walked through the doors of Picori were advocates, patient advocates, and yeah. they, they had an agenda, right? That uh, which was not to judge quality of research and pertinence of research, but it was the agenda of their disease or their condition. Mm -hmm. so it was it was complicated, but uh, it sounds. I mean, if your career is any 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 way of looking at this, that you're 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 rarely slowed down by challenge. Uh, <laughs> That that seems. What 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 is uh, what is inspiring you today? What what is what is next for Arlene Bierman? So I, you know, well, you attended our multiple chronic conditions summit. I would like, if I have a chance to implement that agenda that comes out of that meeting, I would be in heaven. I, I think that would be exciting. That would be great. But I do think about like what comes next for me because I've made so many different jumps. You know. Having worked in Canada, I'm very interested in cross-national comparisons and what we could learn internationally in healthcare delivery. Because the other thing I, I learned in Canada was that very different systems at the point of care, the problems are all the same. You know, um, so I would I would like to um, maybe um, do some work on global health related to aging. Um, but on the other hand, I could see getting very micro again and going back to a safety net system and really working on population health. So 
want to very local or very global, I'm not sure. But for now, I hope I get a chance to stay at ARC and um, do our uh, multiple chronic conditions agenda. Do you, do you think medicine today uh, is a career that young people should consider seriously? Yes, yes, absolutely. I think, you know, there's lots of challenges but it is so rich. Um, you know, first of all, I mean, I, just, I still enjoy, you know, medicine and understanding the body and understanding diseases, but it, you could just take so many different paths with it. Um, and I think the way, um, you know, hopefully we'll be, I, you know, like we, we talk at ARC about not only the science of cure, which like 21st century cure, but the science of care. And I think that's developing. And I think there's a huge, opportunity to really figure out how do we organize and pay for care in a way that makes a difference in people's lives and, and as well in population health. And I think, you know, um, there's also, you might not, not know this about me, but in addition to my fellowship at Dartmouth, I actually did a fellowship in community and preventive medicine. And I've been living in two worlds all my life. And I think there's a great, great opportunity to bring together public health and clinical medicine. So I think the opportunities are enormous. So I would, it's challenging, it's not easy, but if, if people know why they're doing it and what they're doing it for, I would really encourage people. And I, and I love mentoring younger people, you know, going through medical school or, or residency. Um, uh Arlene, we are uh, coming to the end of our conversation, but uh, it just occurred to me that, um, you know, we have a generation of uh, future physicians, nurses, therapists, pharmacists, um, future um, researchers, research leaders, uh, people who are going to lead research agencies, uh, funding agencies, who have who have as part of their biography having lived through the COVID pandemic. And, um, and through this time in general. Um, what, what have you learned so far from, from what you've seen in COVID? Oh, what a tragedy. Um, but I do think it's an opportunity. Um, I think all the mistakes that were made, you know, I just feel for all the people who've been affected, all the family, everybody who's lost loved ones. I mean, the magnitude, I don't think we could even get our hands around the magnitude of the, um, you know, the tragedy of COVID. But I do think at the same time as all the people who've stepped up, you know, the practices who went to telehealth, you know, overnight. And I think, you know, just looking at, at, at what COVID is, you know, brought in front of our face in terms of how the system doesn't work, the inequities in our system. I think there's more um, attention being placed on the need to um, focus on public health but hopefully we'll see also the primary care system could be so critical, you know, not only in, you know, taking care of people with COVID who are not as seriously ill, screening test, you know, testing, but also keeping people well and mitigating risk who are living with diseases and how critical that is and reaching out to communities at high risk for COVID. So I hope that we take this as an opportunity to really learn a lot of lessons and say, you know, how can we change our healthcare system to, to be better? Uh, phenomenal, uh, Arlene. I, I also, I've learned uh, a number of things from COVID as well, but one of the things that I think I've learned that is important is that scientists working within the government have made an enormous contribution to the health of people at a time that's very difficult. And in a, in a world that uh, has, has and remains quite confused about the role of science, the fact that uh, we have at ARC someone like you is, is an incredible, an incredible uh, privilege. And I want to express my gratitude for your service. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I think it's absolutely essential. Um, thanks, Arlene, for participating in our, in our, in our CareCast. Um, this, uh, this brings our program to an end. And um, I would like to invite everyone to join us or, for the uh, next uh, CareCast and to uh, join me in expressing our gratitude uh, uh, to Arlene. Um, please uh, stay well, be careful, and see you next time. Bye-bye.